Hi, I want to talk in this video about the Ethiopian Enlightenment, especially the thought of two particular philosophers, Zara Jacob and Walda Haywat, his student. Walda Haywat has some marvelous stories in his writing, uh, including one that I've used to inspire me to tame several feral cats. So it works. Um, but by far the more theoretical is Zara Jacob, his teacher. And so primarily today, I want to focus on the thought of Zara Jacob. Zara Jacob was a contemporary of Descartes, living in the 17th century. He was somebody who had to flee and lived in a cave um, not too far from Aksum, which was then the religious center of Ethiopia, because of foreign influence and political dangers. While he was there, he read the Psalms and he wrote a treatise, which is what we're going to be talking about here. His view is that reason, when you apply it to the, avail the available evidence, supports various kinds of conclusions. It supports the conclusion that the world, which is God's creation, is essentially good. And he thinks that therefore enjoying it is also good. So his entire ethical system, in a sense, flows from that basic picture. That idea that there is a God, that God created the world, God saw that it was good, and that means the basic ways in which it operates are good. So going contrary to that nature is bad. This gives us a version, actually I think a very intuitively appealing version, of something known as natural law theory. He ended up writing in the cave the Hatara, um, the treatise of Zara Jacob, and he outlines there, among many other things, a kind of natural law theory approach to ethics. Now what does that mean exactly? Well, the laws of nature determine not only what things do, but what they ought to do, what functions they ought to fulfill, and what functions they naturally have, so what they ought to do to be doing those functions well. Morality, then, is objective. There is an objective truth about what's right and wrong, good and bad, and what you ought to do, and it stems directly from the order of nature. So the picture in Zaryakob is something like this. At the top, at the beginning of everything, that we need to understand the world and to understand ethics is God. And we have to realize that God is good. Once we come to that recognition, and of course that God creates the world and sees it also as good, then we begin to think, aha, okay, <laughs> the world is good. So Already we've got something that is a normative foundation. We don't have the Hume-style gap between the is and the ought. The world is what is, but the good already gives us the ought, already gives us the normativity in the very foundations of the world. Now the world has basic, you might say, operating procedures that are, strictly speaking in creation, even prior to the world, some conception of natural law the way that nature operates. And God creates that, and then that's involved in not only the creation of, but the operation of the world. That too is good. And so all of that is set up so that it's already thoroughly normative. It already has a kind of moral structure built into it. Now, as I've mentioned here, one of the ways it does that is that it assigns certain things a function. The eyes are foreseeing. So when is something a good eye? When it sees well. It's really just Aristotle, in a sense, building that normativity, building that function in. And then things are doing their job well when they're fulfilling their function. A good heart pumps blood well. A good kidney filters blood well. And the same thing is true with all the organs of the body. But of course, it's not just organs. We're going to judge the same with respect to our dispositions, with respect to our ideas, with respect to human institutions. All sorts of things now can be evaluated, including religions themselves. We're going to be in a position, he says, to actually make judgments about what religious views might be right and which ones might not be right, because any religion has to think this, he says. And then you can look at the details. You can say, well, now are the rest of its commands consistent with this idea that there is a good God who created the world as good? And if so, then all right, it's got a chance, right? It is rational to hold the beliefs of that religion. But if not, then something goes astray because any religion is going to think this is 
part of its foundation. Now, if you have an odd religion that says, no, the world is controlled by an evil deceiver, maybe things go out the window and this argument won't work. But he says any religion is going to probably start from this premise, but then he thinks many of them go astray. So we'll see that argument, but it's not just religions either. It's all sorts of secular philosophies, all sorts of moralities, all sorts of behavior we engage in, departs from that basic picture. And we'll have to see how as the treatise progresses. So let's start with that conflict among various religions. Defenders of each religion claim that they know the only true way. But not all of them can be right. It can't be the case that the native Ethiopian Christians, for example, and the Jews and the Muslims and the Catholics coming in from France and other parts of Europe to try to uh, be missionaries to Ethiopia at the time. That was part of what led to these political and religious tensions. And then the various native African religions that were not Christian and so on. All of this, he said, look, all of them make claims about reality, about God, about what we ought to do, how we ought to live. They can't all be right. They conflict with one another. So how do we decide who's right? There is a view popular these days that all religions really come down to the same thing. Well, Zara Yaakov was under no such illusion. He said, that, that's clearly not true, <laughs> okay? I, I, I look around me in 17th century Ethiopia and I find people attacking one another. I find them hostile. I, find, I have to live in a cave for a year to try to get away from the conflict. And so there's a huge threat here. There are obviously conflicts, not just among political actors with these motivations, but among the religions themselves. And they conflict with people who are not religious and have a very different attitude about how we ought to live. So how do we resolve those conflicts? Each group claims it's right. Can't all be right. But where do we find any neutral way to decide? How would we find any neutral ground? Well, how do we tell which of the revelations they claim actually come from God? Most of these religious groups say, hey, God told us this is the way. Well, how do I know God told you that? They, those guys claim God told them that, and that's different. So how do I tell what really came from God? Well, here is how he puts it. Who would be the judge for such a kind of argument? No single human being can judge, for all men are plaintiffs and defendants between themselves. Where could I obtain a judge that tells the truth? My faith appears true to me, but so does another one find his own faith true. But truth is one. Okay, we can't be relativists. We can't say, well, that's true for you, but this is true for us. That doesn't work. Either there's a God or there's not, for example. Either it is commanded that we do this thing, or it's not commanded, it's forbidden. Can't be both. And so he says, all of these people pretend to know all of this stuff, but look, they know nothing. They can't support what they're saying. They can't convince me that their revelations that they claim are actually real. They can't prove that their way of living is better than that way of living. What do I do? What he's giving us here is a classic skeptical argument, an argument from variability. The classic form of that is, look, there are different ways of perceiving things. In this case, different ways of seeing how people ought to live, different ways of understanding God, different ways of understanding God's commands, different revelations that you might take as real. But then second premise, undecidability. There is no neutral way to tell who's right. Ask a Muslim whether he has the true faith, he'll say yes. Ask a Catholic, yes. Ask a Jew, yes. Ask an animist, they'll say yes. Ask an atheist, yes. And so there's no neutral way to tell who's right. They're going to advance arguments that are self-serving and rest on the foundations of their worldview. So what do you do? He says it's impossible to know which way of perceiving or construing things is correct. Or at least it seems that way. The only alternative to that skeptical conclusion is finding some common ground. And that's what he thinks he can do. He says, I'll tell you what. <laughs> if we're going to have any way of dealing with this at all that's rational, then reason had, been, had better be able to do this. So we have to find some ground on which reason can stand so that reason can make some kind of neutral judgment. And that's what he tries to do. So, Zara Jacob does not rest content with that skeptical conclusion. He turns that argument on his head. He says, look, um, no, to the person who seeks it, truth is immediately revealed. He who investigates with pure intelligence set by the Creator in the hearts of each man and scrutinizes the order and laws of creation will discover the truth. 
So he rejects the claim that we can't know. We can know. But wait, there are all of these approaches to how we should live, what religion commands, what revelations are correct. That variability premise seems obviously correct. So he ends up rejecting the second premise of undecidability. He says, no, there is a way of deciding. There is some common ground upon which reason can operate. We can have knowledge because God has given us intelligence, because God has given us reason, and because we can actually see the glory of God in the world around us, recognizing that the world is good. And from that, that's enough. It may seem minimal, like God created the world and the world is good. That's all we need. That's all we need, he says, to get us through at least the ethical thickets, but also to tell us some important things about the nature of religion itself. So he says the only way to tell the pretenders from the true revelations among all these religious groups making their own claims, is to use reason to discover the moral truth, and then judge the claims of those religions by the light of reason. Now, as we'll see, none of the particular religions I've mentioned does all that well by his criterion, so it's not as if this is an argument in favor of one of them as opposed to the other. He has his own version of a kind of traditional Ethiopian religion that he's defending, but that's Basically, most of the other religious groups around involved in this conflict are going to flunk one of his tests. But here's the idea. Ethics really, in a certain sense, comes first. I suppose we could say it's not quite true that ethics precedes religion. We could take this foundation for religion, this ur-religion, if you want to think of it that way, this fundamental religion, the idea that God exists, created the world, that God is good and the world is therefore good. That's all we need. Everything else really is going to give us some conception of ethical truth. And once we've got that, we can evaluate the rest of the religious claims. So although we don't start independently of religion at all in Zer Yaakov, we take something that he thinks of as a plausible religious start. Now, is that going to satisfy the atheist or every possible combatant in this group? Well, no. But he thinks we can establish that through the light of reason. I don't want to go into that right now. He doesn't really have an extensive or highly sophisticated argument the way some philosophers do. But instead, he says, let's just take that common ground. Maybe not everybody, but still Jews, Christians of various kinds, Muslims, many traditional African religions will all accept that there is a good God who created the world as good. And as long as you give me that, then the rest we can do using the light of reason itself. So that becomes our criterion. We have to defend this idea that God created the world and great, created great things, including us. So God, in particular, created intelligence, he says. God is incomparably great and intelligent, and the world is incomparably great and reveals that intelligence. We share in some of that intelligence. Now, how important all of this is to the argument? Well, we have to trust reason. We have to trust intelligence. And so you may not have to accept all of the details here to, to get that. He has to have reason as the light of the heart, because the rest is going to proceed by argumentation. And if you don't trust the argumentation, you won't trust where the argument goes. But he thinks, look, all I need is that God is great, that God created the world, God is good, the world is good, and that our intelligence is good and will reveal something of the nature of the world and of God to us. So if we've got that, if God is great and God is good, then what God creates is good by nature. Well, God created human beings. So human beings are good by nature. We are essentially good. Now that's surprising. Most religions are not so convinced of that, really. Um, but he said, wait, it follows, right? I mean, we are created in the image of God, according to the Christian and Jewish traditions, at least. And we're good by nature. God created us, moreover, as parts of a good world. We are good by our very nature. We aren't just some kind of weird virus on the world. We are a good and important component of the world. So God created us. We must be naturally good. And what, what he means by saying good by nature, that doesn't mean, hey, we can do no wrong. It doesn't mean, hey, just relax, do whatever. However, it does mean our basic dispositions, our basic tendencies are good. So he says, a wisdom, a wisdom that is shameful fails to agree 
with the wisdom of the Creator or with the order and laws of creation. I mentioned that our dispositions and the laws of nature in general are good. Well, among those laws, <laughs> among the world's constituents, are people. And among the laws of nature, then, are the ones that govern people, and in particular, poof, that give us certain dispositions. What I mean by a disposition is a tendency to action. So I will have a disposition, for example, to eat because I get hungry, and so I am disposed to eat. If someone injures me, I may have a disposition to become angry, let's say, at least if I perceive that as unjust. Or suppose I lose something important to me. I have a disposition to become sad. He thinks I have a disposition to use my intelligence, to think about the world, and to try to solve problems. All of those are basic dispositions of human life. And they are basic to us. They are things that are driven, are, are well, driving us to do various things that we do. Now, that's not to say we don't have choice. We do. But we have certain basic tendencies. And the basic tendencies are good. So these dispositions are things that we have to classify as good. Any religion that tells you certain basic human dispositions are bad, he says, nope, nope, wrong, <laughs> violation, okay? God is good. God creates nature in such a way that nature is good. God creates us in such a way that we are by nature good. These dispositions are part of our nature. They are good. So don't trust any religion that tells you that there is something fundamentally wrong with your own human dispositions. You may do the wrong thing on the basis of them, but those basic tendencies, they themselves have to be good. So, a wisdom is shameful if it denies that, if it says the order and laws of creation, those basic dispositions are not good. Reason is the light of the heart. It is something that is going to allow us now to analyze the claims of various religions, but also analyze what must be true if we ourselves and our basic dispositions are good. It's going to tell us to reject any ethical prescription that implies that the order of nature itself is wrong. That order of nature can't be wrong. It's something that is fundamentally good. So, rules that restrain our natural dispositions may be acceptable, but those that contradict them can't be. It's fine to restrain them, saying don't do this too much, <laughs> but not to deny them altogether. So here I think the idea is supposed to be, well, something like the idea we find in Confucius or Aristotle of virtues being means with, between extremes. That's not itself something Zara Yaakov directly says. But the idea is, and here I'm going to draw something like the little line of this being the mean, which would be the virtuous place. He says, look, typically we have dispositions that have the following structure. I get hungry, for example. I want food. If I don't go along with that disposition, I'm going to be in trouble. It's a good thing that I have that disposition. The desire for food is a good thing. And so I've got a disposition that is telling me to eat. But of course, then I've got a contrary one that tells me not to eat too much. So one way of looking at this is that these dispositions often come in pairs. Another way is to say, well, they weaken, right? Well, here, if I'm very hungry, let's say, here, over here is hunger, and then here you might say, yeah, look, uh, the disposition is very strong. As I go towards satiety, <laughs> it weakens. And then if I go to excess, it begins to push in the other direction. Okay, so there is a natural limit. We could draw that as a contrary disposition, or we could say this disposition pushes me in this direction. And once I get too far past here, then it begins to rebound. Think of this as something like, I don't know, a force that pushes me until I get to this point, and then that comes back to this position. Maybe like a spring that propels me this way, but then begins to pull me back. Okay, so if that's right, we could think in terms of the contraries, but I think it's actually more natural in Zara Jacob's terms to think of this as something like a spring, a spring that will push me in this direction. And it's a good thing it does. I need to eat. It is not good if I forsake food and don't eat. But on the other hand, it's also a bad thing if I eat too much. The natural disposition is going to pull me back. So that is going to suggest 
Not that there is one point here exactly that's the mean, but there's going to be a region in here where my disposition is doing what it wants to do, and I'm doing the right kind of thing on the basis of it. I am indeed giving in to my hunger up to a certain point, but then I've had enough. Then finally so somebody offers me a third piece of pie, and I say, oh no, no thank you. <laughs> and that's something that I, I need to develop, because after all, the hunger itself is good, and I can allow that string to become, or spring to become too extended. And notice what happens. If I do, if I stretch out that spring too far, what happens to a spring? Well, it no longer pulls me back right. It gets too stretched out. And so it is possible for me to distort these dispositions. I can distort something that's good. I can not only go beyond it and eat, for example, way too much, or start fasting and eat way too little. Both of those are real possibilities. And he says, look, your natural disposition is going to be fighting you in both cases. Right? You're going to be thinking, oh, I'm already so full, but it tastes so good. Or here, like, I'm very hungry, but I, I promised I would not eat. I'm trying to lose weight, or I've got, I'm on a religious fast, or whatever it is. He's saying, look, your body is telling you what you need to do. Now, of course, if you consistently fail to do it, you're going to lose some of that. The spring is going to be ruined. <laughs> so don't ruin the spring. The spring in its original form is good. Okay? And it's pushing you into this region that's good. As long as you end up here, you're good. But, you know, anything that tells you that basic spring, that basic drive is wrong, has to be wrong. It's not correct. Well, what we said here about food might be true for all sorts of other basic drives. For pleasure, for comfort, for sex, for shelter, for all sorts of things, for achievement. It's all like that, okay? Hence this idea that virtue is some kind of mean, that ends up emerging here. That's not fundamental. The fundamental thing is that we have these, if you will, self-limiting dispositions. And they're good. They are good spring-like dispositions that push us toward where we ought to be, but also pull us back if we go too far. But they can be destroyed, they can be ruined, and we can act contrary to them. Any system that tells us to act contrary to them is not telling us the right thing. What this does is give us an ethical test. It gives us a way of evaluating the foundations for morality. It also lets us test religious beliefs. Any of you that teaches that some part of the natural order or some natural disposition is wrong can't be correct. So we can already reject any ethical theory that says acting on that disposition or this disposition is always wrong, or for that matter, is always right. No, neither one can be the case because of the nature of our dispositions. Anything that teaches us that we must totally forsake a natural disposition is wrong. So, he says, God has illuminated the heart of men with understanding by which he can see the good and evil, recognize the licit and the illicit, distinguish truth from error, and by your light we see the light, O Lord. If we use this light of our heart properly, and it's fascinating that he uses that term for reason, the light of the heart, it's something that also appears in Descartes, intriguingly, at around the same time. If we use that light of the heart properly, it cannot deceive us. The purpose of this light, which our Creator gave us, is to be saved by it and not to be ruined by it. Everything that the light of our intelligence shows us comes from the source of truth, but what men say comes from the source of lies. Our intelligence teaches us that, uh, teaches us that all Sorry, I'm having trouble reading that. I made a, such a beautiful slide, I can't read my own slide. And our intelligence teaches us that all that the Creator established is right. So that brings us back to the central point, which is God created the world, God created us, saw that this creation was good, we came equipped with certain natural dispositions, they're good, anything that denies that is a faulty ethical theory and a false, faulty religious view. Well, this gives us an important ethical test and a way of evaluating certain claims. So here's a claim. What about polygamy? Is it okay for a man to marry more than one woman? Some religions say that it is. Some secular philosophies say that it is. Zer Yaakov says that's not true. The law of creation orders one man to marry one woman. If one man marries ten women, then nine men will be without wives. This violates the order of creation and the laws of nature, and it ruins the usefulness of marriage. Now what's going on here exactly? I think there's something new here. 
something new and a different kind of consideration that we need to consider. If we contemplate what's happening here, it's not only this spring-like idea, though it is indeed partly that, a drive for sexuality, a drive for companionship, love, that's good, and it's something that we should fulfill, but of course, there's a natural limit to it. We don't want to stretch the spring out too far. So I think part of this is a real individual component. Look, it is not good for you to pursue lusts and a desire for companionship and so on excessively. You're going to, as it were, stretch this out. You're no longer going to be able to find that mean. You're going to distort your own natural dispositions, and you're going to ruin the ability of other people to achieve the same thing. You're going to be frustrating not only your own, but many other people's natural dispositions in this regard. But there is something else that I think is lying behind this, and it becomes critical when we turn to some of his other arguments and ethical tests. God creates the world, and the world is good, but so far I've drawn this as a static picture. The world, however, is not unchanging. The laws of nature govern the way in which it changes. And if the world is good, and it's something that changes over time, then we have to think, look, it is good to preserve it. God has created this marvelous thing, but it is up to us to continue it, to allow it to continue. And in particular, human beings, human life is good, and it's important that it continue as well, and that it continue in a way that is good. So his perspective is not simply static. It is, first of all, dynamic. We have to understand the fact that the world and humanity, human society, changes, and we have to pay attention to those changes. That means our considerations need to be long-term. We need to think not just, well, what happens to my dispositions today or next week or next year, but we have to think, what happens to other people? What happens to the social order over periods of time? What happens to a society if a few people, for example, are dominating all of the women in that society and most men have no opportunity to ever have love or a family? Well, he says that's it's not good. It is not a good thing. And in general, things that preserve human society, human civilization, human life are good. They are part of this idea of, hey, wanting to continue God's creation. He does think we have a natural disposition toward that. People desire children. And so there is that natural tendency, but also he says even independently of that, if this world is good, if life is good, then the continuation of life is good. And so that tells us something important too. It isn't just our own dispositions and our own, you might say, role in preserving the social order that is good. We have to think about the entire order in the long run as well. Well, that tells us, he says, that a lot of things said by various religions and various other groups cannot be right. Some groups say that sex is evil or unclean. Can't be right. We have a natural disposition to it. Some say that dead bodies, that menstruating women, that a variety of different kinds of animals and other things are unclean. He says, don't trust anything like that. Why? They're parts of creation. How can anything that is a part of creation and a natural disposition be unclean? Some hold that monastic life is better than marriage. He says, that's not true. People have a natural desire for companionship, for love, for sex. That can't be denied as good. That's part of creation. Polygamy is permissible. We've already seen his argument against that. Slavery is permissible. No, that's absolutely unacceptable. And why? Because God has created us in his own image as beings that get to live freely, exercising the light of reason. Anything that denies humanity that dignity is against the law of reason and against the rules of nature, and so has to be illegitimate. Um, that one should leave one's family behind? He says, no, we have a natural attachment to family. Any religion that denies that cannot be correct. That fasting is at times required? He says, but we have a natural desire for hunger, uh, or a natural tendency to hunger, for a desire for food. It says any religion that tells you you cannot eat at certain days or certain times of day and so on can't be right. Well, what do we do about the fact that things do go wrong in the world? The good sometimes suffer. The wicked sometimes prosper. He says, well, that's true. But a good God wouldn't establish an order that rewarded wickedness and penalized goodness in the long run. 
So we don't always say that balancing in this world. We often do. I mean, often good people do get their rewards. Often bad people do suffer the consequences in this life, but not always. The rain falls on the just and unjust, as the Bible says, and sometimes the good do suffer, the wicked prosper, even the sparrow falls. There must be another world in which justice is done. And so this becomes his argument, a moral argument, for the existence of a life after death. And he says, well, things don't exactly balance out here, and yet we know that God created a good world, so if the good isn't entirely contained in this world, it must be contained in something larger. There must be another life and another justice, a perfect one, in which retribution and reward take place. There is another very important rule he deduces, the golden rule. He says, we desire that men show mercy to us. It's therefore fitting that we ourselves show the same mercy to others, as much as it's within our power. What we want done to us, we should do to others. And why? Well, because of that larger scale consideration. It's not just that we have a natural disposition in this direction. We recognize that our own natural disposition is going to be frustrated in a lot of cases unless other people share that and act upon the same natural disposition. We do have a natural desire to empathize with others, and we want others to empathize with us. And so we need to exercise and cultivate ways of behaving together that will not only allow but encourage us to, to follow that natural disposition. Well, finally then, the goal really is the continuation of life and existence in this world. It is the will of the Creator we come into and remain in this life. It isn't right for us to leave it against His holy will. So this is why we have to do things not only to continue our own lives, including work and work hard. Manual labor is something that is a moral requirement, not just a prudential requirement. It's not just, hey, good for us to meet the necessities of our lives and work for our own self-interest. It is morally required of us but not just our own individual interest, for our collective interest too, for the welfare of humanity as a whole viewed in the long run. So there are many other things that agree with reason, are necessary for our life and our lives together, for the existence of mankind. We ought to observe them. They are the will of the Creator. They are part of the functioning of a good world. So in short, in the end, Zara Jacob says, we do, on that very thin basis, of a good God creating a good world, have a way of judging how we should live, how other people should live, and what kinds of religious claims we ought to take seriously.